The word victim. We often hear the word used in many different cases, on you know, many different days during the week. In conversation with people, people feel that they are a victim. There may be some of you here today that this message is not going to reach because you've never been a victim. You've never been a victim of anything. You've never been taken advantage of. You've never been treated badly. Uh, no crime has ever happened towards you. So you are not understanding what it means to be a victim. But for the rest of us, we understand the word victim very much. I have been the victim of a crime twice in the month of June. At the very first of June, I had taken my son to a football camp in uh, North Greenville University in which my wife gives me a call early on a Saturday morning and said, Honey, we've got this phone call from our bank. SunTrust called us and told us to give them a call on their fraud alert that something is going on. So I, I called out there in the sweat watching the boys practice, talked to someone at SunTrust in which they told me your debit card number and PIN has been compromised. I had been a victim of a crime. SunTrust was great. They didn't approve anything. There, there was no big deal. Life went on. Well, this past week, guess what I found out? My SunTrust credit card had been compromised. They had not my number, and somebody tried to buy $300 worth of shoes. I'm sorry, I'm a guy. I don't understand that. <laughs> Why in the world would you spend $300 on a pair of shoes? I, that's, you put your stinky feet in them. I don't understand. <laughs> But somebody tried to buy $300 worth of shoes with my credit card. And SunTrust called and said, there's something strange in the neighborhood. Uh, and I'm glad that they understood that that was not me. So I've been a victim of a crime twice just this past month. And oftentimes when we're a victim, we often want to be revengeful or get back at someone. Or we get angry, we get mad, we get upset. But more often than not, the things that we suffer from when we feel like we are victimized, are not criminal acts, but they're just unfair experiences that happen into our, in our life because of someone else or some circumstances. What do we do when the circumstances and has taken us down a road we were not expecting? We're on this detour, and it just seems like the detour is never ending. It seems like the detour is going on and on and on. Have you ever been in your car and have to take a detour and you get on a detour and you've been on it so long you're wondering have I missed the turn? I don't understand. Am I even on the right detour still? In life it's the same way. Sometimes we find ourselves on a detour and we, we, we are asking God and wondering God will this thing ever stop or end? I want to get back to where I was in my life. I want things to be like they used to be. I don't want to be on this detour anymore. So what do we do? How do we respond when it seems like the sun will never set on our detour? I often think about the movie, The Groundhog Day. Many of you have probably seen it, where he just keeps waking up and he's reliving the day over and over. It just seems like it will never end. Well, we have been looking at the life of Joseph. Joseph has been unfairly treated by his family. His brothers have threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. He has been a slave. But while he was a slave of the head bodyguard for Pharaoh, he was blessed. Everything he did was blessed because the Lord was with him. And he, he got to rise to the, the, the leader in the house. He was the man. Everything he was in charge of, even the other slaves, until one day a woman came along, got mad, and told a lie on him. She told a lie, and he wound up in jail. This jail that he got sent to is more like a dungeon. It's not like we would think of jail today. This was more like a dungeon type of atmosphere. Even there in the prison, though, in this detour, in the dungeon, the Lord was with him. And if there's one thing I want you to hear today, and that is this. The length of your detour does not determine God's presence in your life. You may have been on a detour and it may be lasting your entire lifetime, but it does not take away the fact that God is in your life no matter what's going on. Because God is near. Once again, Joseph becomes the man in charge while he's in prison in this dungeon. In chapter 40, we pick up the story where all of a sudden, 
there, he gets these roommates, these two guys that get thrown in prison with him, the cupbearer and the bacon, baker. There are people all around us every day who are experiencing pain. This last week I have heard some stories of people, children, adults experiencing pain. Some have been the pain of hunger in their stomach because they had nothing to eat at home for their entire family. Some is the pain of seeing a dad who does not love the Lord and will say with cuss words things about Jesus Christ. And this boy's heart is breaking for his dad. The pain of knowing that a child is slapped in the face when he does something wrong. The pain of a little girl who her mama, her stepdaddy, her grandma, her grandpa, her her two aunts... Some of them don't believe and none of them will take her to church. But she wants to know about the Lord. She wants to be close to God. Let me tell you something. There are people all around us every day who's experiencing pain. Joseph found himself in a dungeon. And his detour that he thought that he, he was going one way in life. I, I've had these dreams. Great things are going to happen. But he finds himself on a detour going from one thing to another. And it seems like the detour is never going to end. Here he is in jail again. And we find him with these two companions one more time. The greatest test of the experience is the test of our attitude. Can I say that again, Mr. Bob? The greatest test of our experience on a detour is the experience of our attitude. Because let me tell you something. We know more about who we are in Christ when things are not going our way than when things are going our way. Ooh, it got quiet in here, didn't it? Because what I'm talking about is the real you and me. When things don't go our way and we get a little aggravated and the detour is lasting too long or something else happens and it just seems like it's pushing us backwards, the real us begins to come out. And a lot of times it's things that I don't really like, Clint. It's, it's, it's things that I don't like about me. But the real test of who we are is our attitude in the midst of the experience of detours that just seem to not have a setting sun. Do not mistake being forgotten by people By being forgotten by God. Sometimes we feel lonely in the midst of our detour. Joseph felt this way. Here he was in this jail. This is a dungeon. And what's very interesting is this is the the king of Egypt's place where he puts things. The Pharaoh. This is his jail. Now, this is free of charge. Won't cost you a thing today. I noticed there's a connection between... The uh, verse 4 of chapter 40 says the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of this cupbearer and this baker. Can I remind you who, who Potiphar was? If you flip over to chapter 39 and look at verse 1, the captain of the bodyguard's name is Potiphar. So here is Potiphar. He's put Joseph in this jail and in this prison. Now there's these two guys that Pharaoh says, these two guys, they need to go to jail right now. And so he, this bodyguard takes them and gives them and says, Joseph, you're in charge of these two guys. I think that's a beautiful picture to show that your attitude and your action right where you are right now in your detour will determine your blessing as it comes in years to come. If you are faithful now and do the right things, God will do greater things through you later on because of your witness right now in the midst of the detour. Don't wait till the detour is over before you step up to do something great for the Lord. Do you hear me? Don't wait for it to be ended before you step up and say, I'm going to do something great for God. Do something great for God right now and then you'll see that God's going to do even greater things with you later on if you'll trust in Him. Joseph trusted in the Lord. See, Joseph understood when you're given lemons, then you should make what? Oh, no, 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 no. Joseph saw it as, you give me some lemons, I'm making a lemonade stand. I'm going to set up a shop. I'm going to, I'm going to make a lemonade stand out. I'm not just going to make some lemon, lemonade for me. I'm going to make a stand. I'm going to do something great with what I'm given. See, Joseph's attitude understood that to be in the will of God sometimes means that you're not being blessed in your circumstances. Oh, me. God's will, He can be doing greater things through you and in you because of the difficulty around you than when there is great blessings coming all about you. Because God can do more inside of you in the mess of your life than He can with all the blessings that he pours onto you. 
And we have to look at Joseph here and understand, here's, here's a guy, he's in this dungeon in this pit. And he saw the hand of God in the midst of his detour. Psalm chapter 199 Verse 71 says, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statues. The writer of Psalm is saying, Even though it's been tough and it's been hard, it's been a really good thing. You know, some of the most difficult times in my life has yielded the greatest blessings of coming to know the Lord better. Whenever I found myself crying out to God, saying, God, I don't understand, asking Him why, those are the times I got to know the Lord the best. See, when things are going great, it's real easy for us to forget about the Lord, isn't it? But Joseph understands that even in the difficulty, God is with him. Reminded of the cartoon, whenever we're going through these difficult times and these detours just seem to last forever. Maybe you've seen this tar cartoon. I think it's Ziggy, and he is just standing on this hill looking up into the stars. And he's got his hands up raised and he says, Am I on hold for the rest of my life? Sometimes we feel that way, don't we? We feel like we're on, on this detour and this mess is going on and it just won't stop, Paul. It just keeps going and going and going. And we're wondering, God, are you ever going to rescue me out of this? I thought, God, you said you are our rescuer or you are our refuge. You are the one that delivers. you got great plans for me, plans to prosper me and not to harm me. Why am I still on this detour? Hello, God, are you there? Did you put me on hold? We feel that way sometimes. But I'm here to declare to you that in those moments when you don't feel like God's listening and He's not there, that's exactly where He is at. Notice what Joseph does. In the midst of his prison and dungeon, he sees two guys who are in trouble. He was in charge of the cupbearer and the baker. Now the cupbearer's role was this. The cupbearer, he was actually to taste everything before the Pharaoh was to drink it. He was going to taste it to make sure of two things. Number one, he wants to make sure it's not poisoned and Pharaoh's going to die when he drinks it. Now you want to talk about a tough job. Each drink you take could be your last. But the second thing that he did, not only was he just protecting Pharaoh from you know, something that's going to kill him, but something that would not please him, something that tasted bad. So this cupbearer was a guy that had the life of the Pharaoh in his hands. He was one of the most trusted individuals to Pharaoh. And the cupbearer would take these things, drink them, and then present them to Pharaoh if they were okay. There's this other guy who was the baker. Now he baked things. He, he baked things like cookies. I like cookies. I don't know if they made cookies back then, but when I think of a baker... Ms. Barbara, I think of a, so someone who bakes cookies. I think of cakes. I think of pies. I think of bread, which, by the way, if anybody would like some hamburger buns or hot dog buns for your 4th of July cookout, I have a whole bunch of, of, of packs right back here that were given away that was left over from yesterday. So here, here's a blessing for you. Please take some of those home. But this baker, he would make things for Pharaoh. And what's interesting is both the baker and cupbearer get thrown in this prison at the same time. Why do you suppose they both got sent at the exact same time? Because whatever it was, the offense they had in common had to do with food. Pharaoh must have been Baptist. He had to be Baptist somewhere down deep inside. Because something didn't settle with him about his food and he sent them both to jail. So one day, one night actually... The cupbearer and the baker. Mr. Don, they have, a, they have a dream. And it was a nightmare. They did not know what it meant. They wake up the next day and they're wondering. And their heads are down. And Joseph notices there's something going on with these two guys. He cared so much, even in the midst of his mess, to notice someone else in their mess. Let me tell you something. You want to... You want to find joy in your detour, in your mess of life? Start looking for other people to help and serve. I guarantee you that will help you through your mess. Joseph's eyes were so much on the Lord that he could see other people in need. And so he saw, saw these two guys and asked, Why are your faces so sad? Why are you so, so sad today? In which the cupbearer begins to share his dream. And his dream shows 
uh, whenever he tells his dream to Joseph, he says, I don't know what this means. And Joseph says, well, I know what it means. He says, in three days, you're going to be restored back to Pharaoh. And then, then, everything's going to be fine. And the baker said, well, that's great news. What, what am I to do then? Here's my, here's my dream. Tell me about mine. Since that was so good, I want to hear about mine. In which Joseph said, in three days, you'll be, be delivered to this prison, but it will be to death. You will be killed in three days. Joseph was honest and he was truthful. So here we find Joseph being honest with these two guys. And here's something I want you to write down today, and that is this. And I don't want you to forget this. This is important. Write this down. I can be useful. I can be a useful instrument in the mighty hand of God in the midst of my mess. I can be useful in the mighty hand of God in the midst of my mess. See, God can use you right where you are when you're totally submitted to Him. In the midst of your mess. God can still use you. You can say, well, you just don't know how messy things are. When you see the mess where God can't use it, you're seeing a God not big enough to do something. And my God's big enough to do greater things through your mess than I can do with your blessing. Because my God is big. Chuck Swindoll said, one of the beautiful things about the right, right attitude is that with it, every day has sunshine. Imagine, Joseph was in a dungeon where it was dark. But yet... He saw sunshine, that God could do something. Joseph had one request. Would you please remember me? Remember me. When you get restored, just remember me. Joseph had hope. Mr. TJ, at a moment he had hope that maybe I could get out of this jail and this detour will be over. How often do we look at our health, do we look at our life, do we look at our children, our friends, our work situation, and we're wondering, God... Just, just show me a little door and I'll go through it. Joseph sees this little opportunity and says, Just remember me. That's all I ask. Just remember me when you get restored to Pharaoh. But what happens? Let's look at verse 23 of chapter 40. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now I want you to read verse 1 of chapter 41. Look at this. Now, it happened at the end of two weeks. Is that what it says? Did you say two months? Two full years. Let me tell you something. If I ask somebody to, to remember me and I don't hear from them for two full years, I'm pretty sure they forgot about me. Have you ever felt forgotten in the midst of your mess, in the midst of your detour of your life? Have you ever felt like that nobody cares? Let me tell you what happens. Oftentimes, we see the silence of people as silence from God. But do not mistake the way people treat you as the way God treats you. It's two different things. Don't think because you have been forgotten or you're lonely that God has forgotten you and He has left you because He has not. Our problem is, is we equate things when we see it in people as being actually from God. See, Joseph was a remarkable man. He was victimized again and again and again. Yet, he was a man who continued to wait. He was a man who continued to trust. He was a man who continued to hope. He was a man who leaned on God. So what do I do? Some of you today have been misjudged and abandoned by your family, maybe by your friends. Maybe you're in the midst of a mess and you're trying to figure out what in the world is going to happen. Is this thing ever going to end? I want to remind you what C.S. Lewis said. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speak to us in our conscience, but He shouts to us in our pain. It is in the midst of our pain that we can hear God the clearest. So do not miss the fact that God wants to do a great thing in your life. We have two choices in the midst of our, our messes, in the midst of our detours. The first one is this, we can become disillusioned. We can become so disillusioned that we become bitter. We become so disillusioned and bitter at, at people at the church that we don't trust nobody. We become Mr. Cynic and Mrs. Cynic. 
whenever somebody starts to talk about somebody, you always begin with, yeah, but. That comes from being disillusioned by pain. See, pain is not brought into our life to destroy us. It's brought into our life to make us stronger. How does that reconcile to the child that told me that his dad slaps him in the face? Or the little boy who goes to bed hungry every night of the week? That pain, how is God making them stronger? Let me tell you this. We as God's people should do something about it, for one. It's not, it should not come from Washington, D.C., Or some organization from the government to help those in need. It should come from us who have been blessed by God and have been given great things by God. We should be helping these people instead of pushing them off onto somebody else. That's what God's called us to do. So number one, we need to understand their pain should be our pain and we should do something about it. Number two... God is working in their pain. This this world is filled with evil. This world is filled with bad things. But God is working in the midst of their life. Here's the solution. We need to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Flip there real quick, and I will read this to you. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Paul is writing these words in the context... Of suffering. He says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. In other words, Paul is saying, I understand detours. I understand when the mess comes and it seems like it won't end. I, but I've learned the secret to dealing with those. And here comes the one that we all know. We could probably quote it. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. This is not just a motto you write on the back of a football helmet when you're going into a football game. This is about when you're suffering in life and your detour just seems to be going on and messes keep coming, you have learned to be content because your strength is found in the Lord and not your circumstances. Unfortunately, today we get it reversed. I can do all things through my circumstances. But it has to be the Lord first. We have to trust in Him. So what we have to do is this. We must trust in Christ to be our strength. Foremost, Joseph. Foremost, Joseph had an active and viable relationship with God. We do not read anywhere where he became bitter. We only see a man who took what was handed to him and he turned his lemons into a lemonade stand. He did everything he could to glorify his Lord. What are you doing today? How are you dealing with your mess? In the midst of your detours and your mess, you can still be useful. So if you think that you have to wait till things change in your life, till you get to feeling better, until the finances get worked out, Until the job straightens out. Until your marriage gets straightened out. Can I tell you something? Stop putting stuff in front of God. Focus on Him first. Look to Him. Trust Him. And He'll take care of the rest. We want to see God fix all the stuff for us instead of us do something for Him. And that's backwards, ladies and gentlemen. We have to understand. We must find our strength in one place and one place only. And that's Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you for your grace. Today, Lord, many of us are in the midst of a mess. Many of us are in the midst of trials. We are on a detour that seems to not quit. We're hurting. We're in pain. Lord, today may you be our strength. May we find our strength nowhere else except you. Father, would you bring healing to our hearts right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would everyone please stand as we sing this morning?